Good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're at. I'm Ron Gupta, and I'm the program chair for IIT 2020. It's my personal honor to introduce Chandralekha Singh as the moderator for this panel. Chandralekha and I are fellow alums of the same school in India, the Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur. Gives me a special pleasure uh, because of that. And also I spent the first two years of my US life in Pittsburgh at her competing institute at Carnegie Mellon. And uh, that's uh, another pleasure. And I'm still a Pittsburgh Steeler fan. And I know they are unbeaten this year. Chandra Lekha did her graduate work at University of California at uh, Santa Barbara. And uh, she's involved very heavily in physics and related manners. And uh, uh, without really giving uh, much more information about her, you know her. And uh, I'll simply ask Chandra Lekha to take over and uh, conduct the panel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ron. Uh, I greatly appreciate the opportunity to organize this uh, session. How's everybody doing? All right, so welcome to the session, Second Quantum Revolution, Quantum Computing and Communication. Uh, as Ron said, I'm Chandralekha Singh. I'm a proud alumna of IIT Kharagpur. You know, I got my bachelor's and master's degrees in physics from KGP. And not only did I uh, have great teachers at IIT, but also great peers. Being in an environment where everybody was passionate about changing the world and making it a better place really shaped me. I'm currently a professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at University of Pittsburgh. And I'm also currently the president of the American Association of Physics Teachers. So a little bit about this session. So I'm super excited that you are here for this session. While the crowning inventions of the first quantum revolution, transistors, lasers, and classical computers that we are using right now, continue to enrich our lives, newfound excitement surrounds the use of quantum phenomena to create a new second quantum revolution. The first quantum revolution was made possible by the formulation and development of the framework of quantum mechanics. The second quantum revolution is enabled by the exquisite coherent control and manipulation of tiny quantum systems that promise transformative improvements in our ability to compute, communicate, and sense. This new field of quantum information science or technology, or QIST, QUIST, promises new opportunities that led to the passing of the US National Quantum Initiative Act two years ago. And Chris Monroe here played a key role in that. In India, National Research Foundation is very interested in QUIST. In Europe, quantum flagship program is showing growth. China, Japan, Australia, and many other countries are heavily invested in this rapidly growing field. So today's session will focus on this area and I have invited five colleagues who are at the frontier of quantum information science and technology research. And I'm sure they have interacted and collaborated with Indian Institute of Technology alumni. And I must say that the several decades that I've spent in the United States, one of the things that I always hear from my colleagues in general is how much they love working with IIT alumni and they really admire IIT alumni's passion, unwavering focus and dedication to their work, their hard work, persistence, and the go-getter attitude. So today I would like to start by introducing each panelist and then ask each of them to tell us about what they are most passionate about right now pertaining to quantum information science and technology and why you should consider a career in this area. This will be followed by me posing some questions about why QUIST is an exciting field to work in, the types of job opportunities that are available in this area, and what the future looks like for this field in the coming decades. 
All right. So first, I have the pleasure of introducing David Oshalom. David, can you wave your hand? So David is the Louis Family Professor and Deputy Director of the Pritzker, Pritzker School of Molecular Engineering at the University of Chicago and Director of the Chicago Quantum Exchange. He is also a senior scientist and the director of QNEXT, a Department of Energy National Quantum Information Science Research Center at Argonne National Lab. Before arriving in Chicago, David was the director of the California Nanosystems Institute and professor of physics and electrical and computer engineering at the University of California, Santa Barbara, where I got my PhD. He works in the emerging fields of spintronics and quantum information engineering, where his students develop new methods to explore and control the quantum states of individual electrons, nuclei, and photons in the solid states. His research includes implementations of quantum information processing with potential applications in computing, imaging, and communication. David received the American Physical Society's Oliver Buckley Prize and Lillian Feld Prize and European Physical Society's Europhysics Prize, Materials Research Society's David Turnbull Award and Outstanding Investigator Prize, the AAAS Newcomb Cleveland Prize, the International Magnetism Prize, and Nail Medal from the International Union of Pure and Applied Physics. He is also an IBM Outstanding Innovation Award winner. David is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the National Academy of Sciences and National Academy of Engineering, and European Academy of Sciences. So David, I would like to start by asking you first, what's keeping you up at night in the area of quiz research that you're doing and why should people consider a career in this area? Well, first of all, thanks for getting us all together, having a chance to chat with all of you uh, this morning or this evening or whatever time it is where you're sitting. Um, I'm not sure things are keeping me up at night, but what has me really excited about this field is I, I still view it like a car going a few hundred miles an hour on low beams, trying to stay on the road, uh, not sure exactly what's ahead, but it's pretty exciting. And I, and I think what excites me is, first of all, the breadth of students that are entering this field. You know, it's not just physicists or uh, engineers or material scientists or computer scientists, it's all of them. And that's remarkable. That's something I've never seen before. And their entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, I think personally that we're very much in a discovery phase in this field. I'm sure others will speak to that, but we're learning rapidly about what can be done, how we take the properties of matter at the level of single atoms and bring them to the human scale by engineering and controlling them. And I think, you know, what's most exciting to a lot of us is it's not absolutely clear where the next discoveries will be, but it's probably clear we haven't hit the big ones yet. That's something I think nanoelectronics has taught us when we look back in time. You know, the biggest impacts are probably in front of us. So that's to me, incredibly exciting. And I think for students to be at the birth of a new technology is rare in your lifetime. And um, you know, we're hoping that more and more people from as broad a background as possible engage. So, I mean, that's my perspective. I think you know, our own research in quantum control, we do very fundamental work, looking to people like Jay and Chris here on the screen to pick out what makes the most sense and move it towards technology. Um, you know, every week it seems like something new is coming and um, it's incredibly exciting. Thank you so much, David, that, you know, that's wonderful. So now I have the pleasure of introducing Chris Munro. Chris, please wave, wave your hand so that Hello. people know who you are. Thank Chris you. Munro is the Vice Zorn Professor of Physics and a Distinguished University Professor at the University of Maryland. And he's also the co-founder and chief scientist of INQ Inc., which is a startup. Chris specializes in the isolation of individual atoms for applications in quantum information science. And at the National Institute of Standards and Technology in the 1990s, Chris led the team that demonstrated the first quantum logic gate. Since 2000, Chris has been at the University of Michigan, University of Maryland, and as of 2021, he will be a professor in the electrical and computer engineering and physics departments at Duke University. Chris's research group has pioneered 
all aspects of trapped atomic iron-based quantum computers, making the first steps towards a scalable, reconfigurable, and modular quantum computer system. In 2016, Chris co-founded IonQ, a startup company that's leading the way in the fabrication of full stack quantum computers. Chris is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, and he was one of the key architects of the recent US National Quantum Initiative Act that was passed. So Chris, what is keeping you up at night in the area of quantum information science and technology? And why should people think about careers in this area? Hmm. Um. Wow. So uh, let me first uh, th thank you as well, uh, Chandraleka and others for, for having me here again amongst friends. It should be a fun hour of discussions. Um, interesting. I, so I had two minutes to prepare. What's what what's keeps me up at night? And, and my answer actually harks back to my uh, time as a student. I, uh, I work best at night, uh, lots of all nighters. And it's sort of like that now because um, we're, we're building quantum computer systems and I'm having to learn new areas, not of just atomic physics, not of just physics, but chemistry, information science, logistics, business. I mean, uh, applications uh, of quantum computers are so widespread that uh, I, I love your, your metaphor, uh, David, about you know, 100 miles an hour on low beams. Uh, that's super exciting. And it does keep me up at night because I have to learn. <laughs> I think we all have to learn so much that is not in our uh, conventional uh, you know, knowledge base. Um, and I, I find that super fun. I mean, being a student is the, <laughs> doesn't seem like it at the time, but it's the best time of your life. And uh, in this field, I think we're all students. Uh, and so that makes for long nights. <laughs> so I'd say that keeps me awake at night, thanks. Thank you, Chris, totally agree with you. Being, you know, that, that's the fun thing, being a student all the time in this area. All right, so now I have the pleasure to introduce Marina Radulaski. Marina, please wave your hand. Marina is an assistant professor in electrical and computer engineering at University of California, Davis. She leads the UC Davis Quantum Nanophotonics Lab. Her academic training includes a PhD in applied physics and a postdoctoral training in electrical engineering at, the, at Stanford University. She also has two undergraduate degrees in physics and computer science at the University of Belgrade and Union University in Serbia. Marina's international experience in quantum and solid state physics research was obtained at Stanford University, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, Hewlett Packard Labs, Oxford University, the Institute for Quantum Optics and Quantum Information in Vienna, Helmholtz Center in Berlin, the Institute of Physics of the Polish Academy of Science the Institu and the U Institute of Physics in Belgrade. Marina was selected amongst the rising stars in electrical engineering and computer science in 2017, and she was named 30 under 30 up and coming physicists by the uh, Scientific American in 2012. So Marina, same question to you. What's keeping you up at night in the area of QUIST? And why should people consider career in this area? Well, first, I would uh, like to thank you, Chandralika, for inviting me to this panel. It is really great to speak to IIT alumni community. Actually, my very first student uh, that started in my new group two years ago is an IIT alum. And I really uh, appreciate all my colleagues and now students who come from that background for their training and ambition and just really they're fun to work with. So uh, what keeps me up at night, and I'm on tenure track, which means that I pull a lot of all-nighters, is um, what we can do with photonics and solid state systems in terms of quantum hardware. So there are several different you know, physical implementations of quantum hardware, and they're represented on this panel very well. And uh, what the photonics brings to the table or actually away from the table is the possibility to carry that quantum information at long distance. At the same time, the solid state systems lend themselves very well, just like in classical computing, to scaling up, to putting many devices on the same chip. Um, and they're you know, 
industrially friendly just because of uh, what we've seen in the 20th century with solid state systems. And so uh, we're studying how we can scale up the quantum entanglement between these devices. And it, it is a very exciting area. Now, uh, I guess as a more junior person on this panel, what I hope to bring to this panel is a perspective of someone who's recently had to choose uh, you know, what to do for the next five to 10 years. And uh, I think quantum science and engineering is a really interesting area for many different reasons, from just being intellectually stimulating, like quantum physics and quantum nature of matter is just extremely fascinating, but then even more so for how interdisciplinary the field is. So whatever you're doing, whether you're a physicist, a computer scientist, material scientist, and so on, you can bring that expertise uh, and, and find a niche in uh, quantum science and engineering. And that also makes the field very inclusive of different ideas, of a lot of teamwork, which uh, I think is not as present in the monolithic areas. So that is why I find quantum science and engineering so interesting. And I hope a lot of your alumni will join in as well. Thank you so much, Marina. That was awesome. All right, so now I have the pleasure of introducing Jay Gambetta. Jay, please wave your hand. So Jay is the vice president in charge of IBM's overall quantum initiative. He leads the strategy and execution of IBM Quantum. IBM Quantum is an industry defining initiative to build the future of computing through quantum computing systems. The IBM Quantum's mission is to devise the tools and capabilities to make quantum computers easy to use and by collaborating directly with institutions and communities to solve real world problems that turn into commercial opportunities. He was named an IBM fellow in 2018 for his scientific work on superconducting qubits, quantum validation techniques, implementation of quantum codes, improved gates and coherence and near term applications of quantum computing in addition to establishing IBM's quantum hardware and software strategy. Under his leadership, the IBM quantum team has made a series of major break breakthroughs in the quantum industry, starting with launching of the IBM quantum experience, the world's first qu qu cloud-based quantum computing platform for users to access real quantum computers. Also, under Jay's leadership, the IBM quantum team released Qiskit, an open source software development kit for developing quantum programs and deployed the Quantum Q System 1, a family of quantum processors for clients that now includes the 27 qubit Falcon and 65 qubit Hummingbird quantum chip. IBM Quantum continues to expand in the market by providing 29 quantum systems open for service over the cloud from anywhere in the world, building the foundations of the quantum industry with the community of partners advancing quantum science and applications via the IBM Q network. Jay obtained his PhD in physics from Griffith University in Australia. In 2014, he was named a fellow of the American Physical Society. He has more than 100 publications in the field of quantum information science with more than 20,000 citations. So Jay, the same question to you. What's keeping you up at night related to QUIST and why should people be interested in this area? Well, thanks like uh, thanks everyone uh, for inviting. Um, first, uh, well, uh, I, I should definitely have someone that writes my bios now. So that was <laughs> clearly something that I haven't heard before. Um, but what keeps me up is uh, everyone's basically touched on it. Um, if we're going to build this quantum computer, um, we've got to keep pushing the technology as well as how it integrates and how it be built into the community. So um, my role now has uh, brings an industry lens, a business lens and a science lens together. And that's pretty challenging. And th that would be most of my work. Um, for me, what's most exciting for the students is I think we're at a time where um, as David said, a lot of these fields are coming together, even hardware, software, computer science, physics, chemistry. And I think there's a lot that students can do. They have access to hardware. When I was a student, uh, 
having quantum systems that you could touch was was not was basically contained to the experiment having that now and all the science that is happening i think there's a lot of innovation that's going to happen ahead so i, I think it's an exciting time for everyone to get involved thank you so much Jay. all right last but not least i'm delighted to introduce jeremy levy now jeremy wave your hand Jeremy is a distinguished professor of condensed matter physics at the University of Pittsburgh in the Department of Physics and Astronomy. He's also the founding director of the Pittsburgh Quantum Institute. Jeremy received a BA in physics from Harvard University and a PhD in physics from UC Santa Barbara. After a postdoc position also at Santa Barbara, he has been a faculty at the University of Pittsburgh. His research interests center around the emerging field of oxide nanoelectronics experimental and theoretical realizations of quantum for quantum computation, semiconductor and oxide spintronics, quantum transport and nanoscale optics, and dynamical phenomena in oxide materials and films. He's a, he's a class of 2015 Vannevar Bush fellow, faculty fellow, a fellow of the American Physical Society and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He's also a recipient of the 20, 2008 Nano 50 Innovator Award and the NSF Career Award. He has received the University of Pittsburgh's Chancellor's Distinguished Research Award in both the junior and senior categories. And he's also received the Chancellor's Distinguished Award for teaching. So Jeremy, what keeps you up at night about QUIST and why should students be interested in this area? Well, uh, thanks. Uh, students are, like a... are people who are trying to pivot their career, change their career, yeah. Yeah, so thank you. Um, thanks, uh, Chandralega uh, and to Ron for, uh, for organizing this session. Uh, really delighted to be here and to be addressing this group of IITNs, the you know, best and brightest in India. Um, so I actually got my postdoc. Uh, I did my postdoc with David. Uh, um, and uh, I've been working in this quiz field for about uh, 20 years now, where the beginning of which we were all worried about what happens when uh, 1999 turns to 2000? We thought all the computers were crashed. We're going to crash, and that was the hardest problem that everybody had to deal with. Um, but but controlling quantum matter is actually much harder than that. Um, and uh, I would say that uh, not only is it a hard problem, but it's one that's really aligned with some of the most fundamental questions we have uh, about our, our world and our universe. And that's really what has motivated me. Uh, to, to, to join and to continue to work in this area. Uh, so about a decade ago, um, I, uh, my group had discovered uh, a new reprogrammable quantum material, which is something where we can literally sketch uh, artificial atoms, quantum wires, and build up quantum materials uh, that are literally limited by our imagination. Um, and uh, we've been using this platform and trying to develop it uh, to understand a wide variety of quantum phases of matter. Um, so the question of what keeps me up at night, I guess I would also say that it's really more about like what gets me up in the morning and it's the excitement of really working on this challenge, uh, uh, this very challenging area. And I think that uh, IITians uh, really thrive on challenge, um, even getting into IIT is a major uh, an accomplishment. And I think that that drive is something that the field, our field really needs right now. Um, and uh, so I'm always, you know, very interested in working with people who, uh, who, who have come, have gone through IET. Thank you so much, Jeremy. All right, so now uh, I will actually ask my first question to Jay and Chris, and this is going to be related to workforce. So there has been such an explosive growth in quantum information science and technology, and it's a transdisciplinary field. Small and big companies are recruiting at a fast pace. Can you give your perspectives on what the workforce needs are in this area of quantum information science and technology? And how can students or people who are just interested in quantum information science and technology who wanna maybe change their career better prepare for these kinds of jobs? And I'm particularly interested in your perspective because you know, while some undergraduate and graduate level degree programs now are coming up that are focusing on quantum information science and technology, a majority of students, you know, unless they have a PhD just focusing on this particular area, do not really actually know much about exactly what is required in this particular industry. So your perspective would be extremely valuable. 
So Jay, why don't we go with you first? Sure. So I think I think for us, I think it's there's a lot. So I would say there's still the need, obviously, for um, um, for people that have a lot of science training and go down the PhD and do that. Um, but as we've built more of the stack and we've got in, in, um, gone more into the development world and we've started to get into um, basically engineering and building out the components, I think there's um, there's a lot of options. So, for instance, if you've got if you've got developer experience, you can get involved straight away. If you've got any experience with micro uh, with um, electronics and engineering in those those ways, uh, we are also building large cryogenic um, uh, infrastructure now. And so a lot of um, engineering and expertise there makes that possible. I think for those that want to see, um, actually the internship programs that um, we and many industries offer give you a real, uh, a real lot of experience. So um, I would say the only thing you really need is a want. And then there's a lot of online uh, material to start to see if it interests you and if you have the interest. Uh, you can definitely find something to do. So anything from pure science to development to uh, helping build, but I'll, I'll come, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much, Jay. And Chris, you are also an entrepreneur. So can you give your perspective on this? Sure. You know, in, in fact, I should, uh, I'm wearing my, uh, my startup background here, but uh, I, I spend mo more of my time at the university actually. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm sort of at that interface and, um, you know, one um, aspect of this field that is indeed behind government's interest in this field uh, from, from the US, India recently, uh, earlier this year, there's a big initiative out of India, China, obviously in Europe, is government can and should play a role in this field because universities and industry are sort of on opposite poles here. You know, uh, Neither of them can do it all. Uh, and, and I think students in this field have an advantage at universities. You know, you can learn quantum physics, be comfortable with it, even if you don't feel like you understand it all, at least you're sort of comfortable with the rules. Um, but at universities, you know, we don't build things. <laughs> um, the analogy I love is, is uh, I, I would never step into a helicopter that was built and designed by graduate students. <laughs> um, this is what industry does. They have, they have veteran engineers who understand reliability, systems engineering, testing, and you know, it takes many decades of training to do that. But so industry has to make quantum computers for, for its future, no doubt about that. But they're not necessarily so comfortable with these radical laws of physics that's pulling the entire carpet from underneath classical information theory. So students in a sense have an advantage that you, you can walk into a company and say, look, I, I have no problem with quantum. I wanna learn about systems engineering. So I, I sort of agree with Jay that the opportunity is in your, it's in your lap as a student to, to go out there. Um, it may sound like a narrow and somewhat esoteric field, but you know, when you're young, that's what you should do. You should take risks. Uh, that's what a PhD is. I mean, you, you end up working on one little thing for many years. And in the process of doing that, you look around and you see how everything is done. And I think, and I think students, even at a, a bachelor level, uh, is, is great having interest in any of the technical fields. Having a little bit of knowledge in quantum is helpful, a little bit of a competitive advantage for students going into industry, even when they're 20 years old, 20 or 21 years old. Um, and, and by going into industry and seeing what systems engineering means, that's a really subtle pair of words that can't really be taught. Um, I'm a professor of engineering as well as physics, and uh, we teach, we, we try to teach that. Um, it's very difficult to do, you have to do it. And so this is, uh, it's, uh, anyway, I, I'm not sure how, how else to answer that, except I think it's all in, all in your lap as students to embrace this field and go after it. And uh, either at industry, national laboratories are a wonderful middle ground I think that can help bridge that gap, and this is why governments are investing such uh, so much into this into this field. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. Yeah, that was that was really great. So at this point, I have you know uh, the next question is for David and Marina. So as you know, I have been really passionate about quantum education. What are your thoughts on how we can prepare undergraduate and graduate students in science and engineering better for quest-related jobs? And what should colleges and universities do to prepare students for this explosive demand in this area in terms of 
workforce needs. And what are the roles of internships and research experiences? In fact, Jay was already saying that they have some of those uh, internships that could be very valuable, but I want to hear your thoughts on it. And what are the differences between getting those kinds of experiences in industry versus academia versus national labs? You know, Chris mentioned national labs. And how will a student decide what kind of internship would be best for them? You know, and how will they find out about these internships and research experiences? So why don't we start with David? Oh, I thought we would start with Rena, but that's, uh, that's okay. Um, well, there are a lot of questions packed into that one question. So um, let me take one step back maybe and say, because this is a really different field that everybody was just commenting on, and it's not just physics or engineering materials, the training has to be different too. And the approach has to be different. First is worldwide, the number of future, let's call them quantum engineers, right, is sobering through a number of things. One is when you look at the wave of retirements hitting companies of conventional engineers, and second, the growing need for this discipline. So one thing I think that's very exciting from a student perspective is the training model will have to change, not just the technology. And that's where, uh, for example, I think Jay and his colleagues at IBM have done an incredible job of helping develop new programs for students to do their PhDs with companies. Not just spending a few weeks interning, but literally taking two or three years and working on joint projects to provide a window into how universities work, like Chris was just saying, um, and also how industry pursues science and technology and getting that experience together as part of your PhD. You know, as Chris said to me, the most valuable thing about a PhD is to become accustomed to failure. Hopefully that's okay to say. Um, well, you know, no, many, that's a great thing to say. I totally believe in it, David. Yeah, many of us are used to failure quite a lot. Uh, Jeremy, I'm not looking at you as a postdoc, you didn't really fail, but, um, but I did quite a bit. And, but you know, through these failures, you learn a lot. So in science, you never actually fail, right? You may not achieve what you're aiming for, but you learn in the process. And I think as Jay said, you know, what you get comfortable with is learning how to deal with things that you simply don't know how to do when you start. And that's essentially the mantra of this field. A lot of us don't know exactly how to get to the destination, but we sort of know how we want to initially head there. So I, I think, you know, it shouldn't be a question of, do you work in industry? Do you work in a university or as Chris at a national lab? I think the way that a lot of us are managing this field is we do it together, where it's project driven, not discipline driven. You know, 20 years ago, you would form a degree in a discipline in physics or material science. But, you know, in quantum engineering and quantum science, I think it's more of a problem. You know, quantum computing, quantum communication, quantum sensing, which involves a lot of these uh, disciplines. And to do that jointly with different environments, I think is the future for quantum education. Not only is it the way to train and to do exciting things and to get broader exposure, but ultimately it's a way to get larger numbers of people also working internationally, which is something I hope very much will develop in the next few years uh, because we'll learn a lot you know, uh, through this process. So. Thank you so much, David. Marina, do you want to add your thoughts to it? Yeah, uh, I'm very encouraged by the number of students, both undergrad and grad, who are interested in learning quantum information. And so at UC Davis, we are responding to this by designing new curriculum. And for example, my graduate course, which is you know very popular, students just want to learn about it. Students get to learn about quantum hardware, and then they also learn to program quantum computers and through our collaboration with IBM Q and Jay's team, um, uh, they get to do their homework on real quantum computers. I think this is really an attractive way uh, for any student to get into the field. And when they have such a focused training, even for just a semester, after that, they have plenty of options for either applying for internships. We have some students, you know, continuing to do research, for example, in my group with color centers or in some other group with some other topics. They also join quantum hackathons. And so there are many different ways to become a part of this community after even just a short retraining. So most of our students come either from engineering or physics or um, uh, math, uh, computer science backgrounds uh, when it comes to interest in, in uh, quantum information. Um, and yeah, I, I really like what, what uh, David said about the collaboration between all sides uh, of the R&D space, 
uh, from academia to industry to national labs. It is still quite early in, 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 in this field to just choose sides. We all need to collaborate very extensively. And that means that any experience that you can get, whether you get an internship or research, uh, you know, summer research experience uh, uh, will place you well to make your next step and your next decision where you feel most comfortable in the quantum ecosystem. Thank you, Marina. Marina, do, do you want to also, you know, uh, address this question that just came through the chat? Don't you think that quantum theory should be completely understood before jumping into applications of it? Oh, that's a really interesting question. Um, okay, so first, I, I would, I, I really like the question because you can also disagree with a question. What does it mean to fully understand quantum theory, right? Uh, I think, I, uh, you know, physicists have been trying to do that for 100 years, and there's still plenty of, you know, open uh, questions. Uh, and also, I think here we need to be understanding of different types of learners. You know, like some, some people are more on the theory side and really like to understand everything before getting into applications. Some people like to go and touch things and code things and break things, you know, kind of break toys apart and learn that way. So in that sense, I think we should provide all of these different avenues to include all types of learners because we need all types of thinkers to make this field successful. Uh, I and, totally and, agree and, with you. Does anybody else have any thoughts on this question? Oh, absolutely. I, I do. Uh, I think that quantum theory is, um, it's really easy. It's confounding. We have no, uh, we have, we, we have no great analogies in real life, but the rules are very simple. The math can get arbitrarily hard, just like water waves, you know, wave equations, nonlinear wave. I mean, that, that's not the point. The point is there are no analogies. So just get used to the rules. They're really easy. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I think we teach conventionally, we teach quantum mechanics very mathematically. We dive into the wave equation and solve, it's like a differential equations class. I think that one of the greatest things about this field of quiz is that it's caused us to teach it. Uh, it's, it's allowed us to teach it from an information theory perspective. Bits go to qubits. Okay, there's a wave equation in the background, but you know, there's gates, lots of analogies from real life. And then there's superposition and entanglement measurement, which if you think about it too much, that will keep you up at night as it should. But um, you know, Einstein didn't figure it out. We're not going to, so just live with it. So quantum theory is actually you know, not, not that hard. Uh, you know, I totally agree with you, Chris. And the fact that you're saying that you know, this field has also given us a new way of thinking about how to teach this thing, quantum, quantum to students, because you know, for too long, we have been doing it in a way that it's not been possible to bring together people from physics, engineering, computer science backgrounds, but you're absolutely right. If we start thinking about it this way, we can make a lot of progress and work together. All right, so my next question is for Marina, Jay, and David. And basically this is about one of the topics that I'm very interested in. You know, How can we promote diversity, equity, and inclusion in the field of quantum information science and technology? And how can we make sure that women and other underrepresented and underprivileged people in science and engineering in general are not underrepresented in this area of quantum information science and technology workforce? And do you think that it's important to start early with outreach and maybe uh, you know, some K through 12 education that involves quiz education? Uh, so I would like to start with Marina. Marina, what are your thoughts? Um, I think this is a really important question, uh, and it is a you know challenge that we have across different STEM fields, um, and often it comes down to the so-called pipeline problem, which is okay. We want to hire diverse PhD students, but then we don't have maybe diverse undergraduate body. Then we don't have diverse high school body, and so on. And social sciences teach us that a lot of female and other diverse students drop out around the middle school age. So it is important to address that pipeline from, from that point of view. But there is a really encouraging thing about quantum information science and technology. As other panelists have mentioned, it's a very growing field. We need many, many new engineers and scientists in this field. That means that we really need to tap into all possible communities to recruit uh, for, um, for these jobs. 
And so um, we can start pretty early in exposing uh, people to ideas of quantum already, you know, with uh, there are many books that are coming out that are uh, targeted at a younger age. So I, I think that is one a promising direction. And then another one is being conscious about it as we're hiring students and as we're including students in the research and so on being open for non-standard ways of thinking, communicating and so on, because that is to our benefit in this field. So for example, UC Davis is a uh, number one of uh, Forbes list for uh, training women in STEM fields. Uh, and, and this is something that's really spread out th throughout our education, how to include more uh, diverse candidates. And, you know, we, maybe we're talking about women here, but they're, you know, people of color, people of different backgrounds and, um, geographically also including as many people possible, which um, what we've seen through IBM initiatives lately with the Global School, uh, Summer Kiskit School and so on, uh, the, the democratizing all of these resources can also help us tap into places that we haven't looked before. Thank you so much, Marina. And Jay, do you want to add anything, you know, for what, uh, you know, she already mentioned IBM Kiskit Summer Global School. Did you want That's to add right. anything else about what IBM could be is doing related to promote, uh, promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion? I think Maria hit it all. Um, to me, I think um, if we are truly building a um, building a future industry, um, we it's all on us to make sure it looks more like the world. Um, so we're committed to it. Maria talked about it. Um, we do things like um, Kiskit, as you said, summer schools, Kiskit, a lot of open open source stuff as well as um, invest with HBCU universities. So um, I take it as a personal mission um, for myself to make sure our team does the best we can. And um, I, I'm just restating Maria's points. We've got to, we're, yes, we've got to address the pipeline, but we've got to look at ways of going beyond the standard ways to see that we can find good, good diverse candidates for the roles that we have. Yeah, I'm very uh, heartened by the fact that IBM has allocated, you guys have allocated $100 million for the historically black colleges and universities for quantum information science and technology. That is absolutely awesome. David, do you have any thoughts on what can be done to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion? Well, I think uh, Marina and Jay have already hit most of the points, both uh, practically and Jay, of course, thank you from all of us financially. Um, uh, this is incredibly important. But one thing I think that's really different here also is that when you're at starting a new technology, you know, we can take lessons from the electronics world where, you know, groups of people push technology, they develop new, uh, uh, new systems, and then try to have people catch up, right, through outreach initiatives and parallel efforts. And I think now we can rethink all of this, like uh, Marina was saying, and think about at time equals zero, you know, why don't we all do this together in a very inclusive way? and bring everybody up together, you know, which is admittedly a challenging effort, but it's a very different model, which for many of us living in urban areas uh, has generated a great deal of excitement. And I think there's a, there's a distinction though you need to make, we all need to make between motivating people and educating people. You know, I, I think what's really gonna help grow a larger diverse community is for people like this, like this session right now to appreciate what this field has to offer and what career opportunities there are for development, you know, as early as possible to get people excited about this. You know, uh, maybe to Chris's example, I think everybody is pretty excited to step into a helicopter, right, for the ride. They may not actually know how the helicopter is put together. They may not even think about how safe the helicopter is, but they're pretty excited to take the helicopter ride, if that's okay, Chris, for me to borrow that. So I, I you know, I view that a little bit like quantum information. I think to excite people, that there's an incredible opportunity and, you know, and great ideas come from everywhere, right? They're not reserved for one location or another. Um, I think you know, that's important for us, all of us to, to push forward on. And you know, I think that will naturally bring inclusion to get a much broader community, which is much healthier for any field, but particularly for science and technology. And I think the fact that as Marina said that we're all thinking about this now in the early days and coming up with the ways to develop it will have a big impact. So I'm very encouraged. Thank you, David. So next question is for Chris. So Chris, related to jobs, you know, there are companies of all sizes starting from startups like IMQ that you are a, uh, a founder for and large companies like IBM, Google, you know, the list keeps going on and on. 
Can you give your perspective on what kinds of skills and dispositions people should have for you know, choosing a startup versus a large company to work in? Um, yeah, yeah, good question. Um, I, I think the majority of the startup companies are more in the algorithm design and quantum software space. This is, this is, a act, this is an activity that's not ca super capital intensive. Um, and it, you know, it makes sense. There, there are lot, there's lots of great results coming from uh, you know, startups in different areas. You know, one of them concentrates on connecting with banks and understanding financial arbitrage and optimizing that type of problem. And of course, banks will hold these algorithms very close to their chest. Um, so you know, the, the, that, that's just one example. Others specialize in uh, modeling uh, molecules and chemical reactions and so forth. Um, our startup is more of a hardware play uh, it, in addition to the software on top. Um, and there are a few others like that as well. Um, but, you know, the, I, I think, um, you know, Jake and color, uh, add some color. The community of quantum computer builders, to be very specific, it's a very close tight community, whether it's IBM or INQ. I think, I think uh, it's, it's, it's a great time now because it's not, Quantum computing is not a commodity. I mean, even the types of qubits, I mean, it'd be like having, you know, vacuum tube, silicon, germanium, classical computers out there. Um, you know, that silicon's obviously the commodity that won many years ago in, in, in being able to scale in certain ways. Right now, it's, it's way behind that time. So it's a very fun time. And, and I, I'll, I'll pile on to, you know, what IBM did in 2016, it was a huge deal uh, uh, unveiling their systems on the cloud for everybody to use. You know, the people that use these machines, maybe they don't care what the qubits are, but there are lots of different qubits that have different, uh, different advantages and different metrics, and maybe they'll have different applications in the long run. So instead of looking startup and big company, I would say uh, if you're interested in industry um, and you have a pension for a particular type of application or a particular area of, of your background that you want, uh, maybe, maybe in physics, you know, solid state physics versus more in my field of marina's field, atomic, photonic uh, uh, systems. Pick, pick the company that way. I, I wouldn't say big or small matters so much at this stage. Um, the, the other difference is, of course, you know, startups have different pressures. Um, you know, we have to raise money, <laughs> either privately or, or anyway. You know, it's possible to do it publicly as well. Whereas bigger companies, uh, especially those that have a foothold in the computer field already, like IBM or Google or Amazon. Uh, there's going to be some stability there for sure. So these are, you know, these are things you should think about. I think startups can move a little faster. There, maybe there's less bureaucracy at the expense of things being a little more risky. You know, the company might not be in business in a few years, whereas I believe IBM will be in business for many years. <laughs> so lots of things. I would. I don't think it's just big or small, but lots of uh, uh, other attributes. Thank you so much. Uh, that, that that's really good, Chris. That you gave a nice overview. So ne next question is for Jeremy. So Jeremy, there is generally a hype cycle associated with different technologies. So in, if for quantum computing, we are still in the inflated expectations phase, then is it possible to avoid the trough of disillusion by quantum tunneling from the inflated expectations phase to the slope of enlightenment and plateau of productivity? What do you think is our role in communicating about quantum computing in such a way that the hype and noise does not take over the reality of the situation. So that's a uh, that's a great question. Um, I don't think that this quantum field uh, is immune to the realities of the hype cycle. I think, though, we in some sense we need to embrace it and understand uh, understand it, um, which is of course is a problem for all new technologies. Um, and I think the important thing to remember is that the fundamentals behind this new field are extremely sound. We all believe in quantum mechanics. It spawned a, an entire revolution. Uh, and the second quantum revolution is resting on that, uh, uh, on, uh, that platform. So I, I do think that it's important for uh, researchers in the field uh, and everybody who's working in the field to to educate the public in a, in a way that balances the justifiable excitement with the uncertainties that are inherent in exploring the boundaries of 
what we know and what we're capable of. And it, um, I think that, um, you know, if you, if you go back to sort of lots of historical things where really what, what the way to think about hype is it's sort of a distorted view of where we think we're heading with new technology is probably wrong. The predictions of where we're going to be and when we're going to be there are probably wrong, but there's a fundamental truth to what is being said. Um, uh, and I think it's important to communicate that, um, but try to do it honestly, not, not cynically. Um, and that, uh, that there, there has to be this level of comfort that we may be wrong in the predictions that we make, but, that, but, for, but taking the bigger view, uh, I think that um, it's, uh, it, it, the excitement and the hype and the, uh, it is very much justified. Thank you, that may, that's, that's really good. So my next question is actually for Chris and Marina. So the question is this, you know, the reward system generally is very different in industries and academia, and that can lead to synergistic advantages. What are your thoughts on how industries and academia can work well together? And is it possible for the same people to move back and forth between these two? I mean, of course, Chris, you are a great example of how one can straddle between these two spaces beautifully. But I'm just wondering, like, do people have to make up their mind? No, I am going to be an academic person or I'm going to be an industry person. So, Chris, why don't you start first? It's funny, just before the, earlier this afternoon, I had a, a meeting with one of my students and she is about to get her PhD and she's, she wants to do a postdoc. She's interested in academics in the long run. But in, in 10 years ago, I would have said, yes, it's sort of a one way valve. If you leave the academic cycle, it's very hard to get back in. There are obviously exceptions. Um, however, in this field right now, uh, I think uh, if she went into industry, in, in fact, I, I wanted her to consider that, you know, look at a few of the companies out there. Um, this particular field has an academic feel to it, even if you're working at Google or Intel or IBM or INQ. Um, and I, I think academics right now, the way all these quantum issues are happening, universities are sprouting up quantum centers everywhere uh, for a good reason. They want, they want, they see that this is important for, uh, for, for the economy, uh, but also it's a fundamental academically rooted field that has not yet hit stride in, the, in, uh, in terms of products for people to use, but we all know it will in some form or another as we're driving down, down, uh, down that dark road with <laughs> really fast with, that, with our low beams on. Um, so, so I think this field um, might buck that trend that if you, if you really like ac academics, you know, maybe now is the time to actually, instead of doing your postdoc at a university, and I'm sort of, uh, you know, I, I don't wanna say this too loudly because I'd love to have postdocs at my university group as many of my colleagues here do as well. But I think going, going to industry, um, I think it doesn't turn off in this field. I don't think it turns off academic positions at all uh, in the long run. So, so uh, it's, it's kind of a night that might not happen forever. <laughs> but uh, on the other hand, I, I, I constantly make parallels to the 1970s and 80s when Silicon VLSI was, you know, was sort of winning. There was Germanium, Gallium Arsenide and so forth. What, what were electrical engineering departments doing then? Well, they weren't doing power management anymore. They were doing Silicon. They became semiconductor uh, uh, play, you know, places where semiconductor research happened. So I think as industry uh, gains a foothold in the field, makes commoditized devices uh, for communication, for computing, simulation, and else and sensing, um, the universities are only going to, it's not a zero sum game, the universities are going to be relied on even more. Um, so universities are going to want to hire faculty who have some, in, some experience in the, at the ground floor of these, of these industries. So um, uh, it, it's funny having that conversation just before this. Um, I think it's a great time to, to consider all the possibilities, not just postdocs. Thank you, Chris. Thanks a lot. Marina, what do you want to add to this? So as I mentioned, this is something I thought about just uh, several years ago. And as I was finishing my PhD at Stanford, I wanted to get a flavor also of industry research. So I did an internship in Silicon Valley. And what I was surprised by is that there's not necessarily that much difference in R&D space. They are connected between academia and industry. I mean, obviously it depends where you go in industry, but that there are many, uh, many jobs that are very similar to this kind of basic uh, research experience that we have at universities. And now also, you know, having chosen academia as my step 
um, I see how closely we work with industry to make these quantum technologies happen. So my lab, which you see behind me actually here, we need to work so closely with the laser companies, with cryostat companies, with the single photon detector companies. And there is a lot of good exchange that can happen between the two, whether you know, my students decide to go to those companies or someone from those companies decides to do, pursue a PhD, knowing what all these tools are for. Um, so uh, I, I think, and you know, I, I guess uh, Chris also said it so nicely as, as he's been hopping between uh, the, the, this wall, between the two sides. Um, and there's a lot of opportunity in a quantum technology for this. Thank you so much, Marina. That's wonderful. So Jeremy, the next question is for you. So although National Security Agency and other security agencies have become really interested in quantum computing after Shor's algorithm for factoring prime numbers that can be done in polynomial time on a quantum computer. What are you most excited about being able to do if we were to be able to make a scalable quantum computer? Yeah, that's a, it's a great question. Um, and I, I would say that, um, that it's really, you know, harks back to, you know, what are you most excited about? Um, in the field, and uh, while the uh, discovery of Shor's algorithm and the ability to factor large numbers was really helped, you know, motivate and fund the field for the last two decades, uh, for me the attraction has always been the ability to solve the most important equation of physics, uh, which is the Schrodinger equation, and it's really the key, I think, to um, it's going to be the key to. Uh, uh, understanding uh, so much about our world, about uh, matter, about uh, future technologies, whether they're quantum or non-quantum. Um, it's, it's such a hard uh, problem to solve in general. Um, and I think that, that that's really, for me personally, um, what is the most, most exciting, exciting uh, avenue of development and the one that, that I'm most interested in working on. Thank you. Yeah, even for me, I think I'm looking at all the other applications and those are the ones that I'm most excited about. So my next question is for David and Jay. And the question is this, you know, there are so many different architectures that are being used for quantum computing. What are your thoughts on whether we will continue with, the, with these different architectures in the next few decades? And will some of them actually be combined into one to kind of optimize their affordances and constraints? So why don't we start with David? Oh, well, once again, I thought you would start with Jay because Jay is actually you know, building and selling architectures. But since I know the least, I'm happy to go first, which is, you know, again, I think when we look at today's technology, it's not just silicon. Right, it's a mixture of materials and technologies and architectures to communicate the way we're doing right now. Right, we're sending signals with photons, we're processing information with electrons, and we're storing them in different ways. So, you know, I, it's hard for me to believe a single technology is going to check every box in a quantum world, particularly when you think about an ecosystem where quantum information is going to have to be kept entirely in the quantum world. Right, from the sensor to the computer to the communication. So I don't view it as a competition between technologies and it's such an early stage, I think, to frame the question this way. But you know, I, I think as we're learning what's working the best at this moment to do certain things, pushing it forward and using it. So uh, you know, it, IBM, for example, and INQ are building these fantastic quantum computing systems. But at the end of the day, you're going to need to link a couple of them together. And that means to entangle them. So I see automatically you're going to have to use photons, for example, as a way to link either quantum systems that are next to each other or across the world from one another to build types of quantum supercomputers, if you like. And, and how will you get information into these technologies? You'll need some sort of sensors, and that would be a different materials technology, presumably, based on the need, right? Whether it's uh, environmental or whether it's medical or whether it's technical. So... Yeah, you know, that's what makes this a really fun field. I don't think there's one answer like silicon. Everything will be silicon. Well, today everything is not silicon, although a lot of it is, admittedly. And I think in the quantum world, it's going to be the same thing. I, I think different needs will drive different technologies. Thank you, David. Jay, why don't you add your perspective? Yeah. So architecture is always a it's a it's a it's a word that 
it requires a little bit more to add to it. So when I think of an architecture, I think on the hardware architecture, and I also think on the software and the and how it how the consumer can, will eventually use it. I think I I really like the cloud model and that architecture, and I think I think that the circuit model and thinking about how we make and make better circuits, these are quantum, quantum instructions and how that gets integrated. I think the future will have us integrate that into basically standard classical um, software and you'll just run, run quantum much like an accelerate. When it comes to what we need to do as a field is we need to keep understanding what circuits are valuable and which ones actually give us an advantage over others. And then as Chris alluded to at the start, I think some circuits will call on different hardware. Some will call on um, other types. And as we, as we progress and understand which ones are the value and understand how to use them, we'll, we'll understand how to do them. Obviously I'm confident in our circuit, uh, in, sorry, in our superconducting qubits and I, by putting out like our path towards a thousand qubits. Um, but even after we get to a thousand qubits, as David also alluded to, we're going to have to connect chips together. And connecting quantum quantum chips, one quantum chip to another chip, is actually going to require um, some type of uh, I like to call it a quantum interconnect. Yes, most likely it's going to be photons. So there's a lot of future research as we build that hardware architecture. So I see. A lot of unknown questions to answer, but I think the high level is we need to build towards circuits and work out how they will be integrated for people to use. Thank you, Jay. You know, I, I, I will actually let you answer a couple more questions since you're here uh, that, that the audiences are asking. So Anand Srivastava is asking, if and when do you think quantum computing will be able to break cryptography underlying blockchain technologies? Is that one for me to answer? Anybody can answer. You know, does anybody have an answer for this? Please I unmute think, yourself. Anybody who wants to answer this. I think within the next 10 years, we'll have machines that are um, pushing the limits of what can be done, uh, uh, pushing the limits of uh, like Shaw's algorithm. And it'll be an interesting time. I think we always underestimate when we look out into the future and overestimate what we can do next year. So I'm confident that in 10 years we'll have some hardware, but I don't really want to put a date on it. We need to build larger systems with higher fidelity circuits. And that's going to be a combination of both better hardware as well as better error correction ideas to make those circuits have higher fidelity. And there, I, I, I'll give you a, not a really defined answer, but with in the next 10 years. Thank you, Jay. Thanks a lot. You know, another audience question is this. So anybody can answer this. You know, how can AI transform quantum research or material science related to it? And this is asked by Vibhu Singh. So anybody, Chris, did you want to answer this? Well, I, I think it might be the other way around. I think one, one of the early, uh, one of the early potentials in small quantum computers with you know, maybe a hundred qubits that are well behaved is is to tackle certain problems in pattern recognition in AI. I'm I'm definitely not. This is one one thing that keeps me up at night is trying to learn what AI is. Even I, so, I'm definitely not the expert there. But um, you know, even a little cheap ad. I mean, even at INQ, we're working with one of these small uh, quantum startups uh, with a small uh, less than twenty qubit quantum computer is starting to work on on. Uh, uh, handwriting recognition um, using uh, well-known AI routines. So I think quantum computing is, it might be the other way around. It might be a tool for uh, helping us uh, uh, tackle certain AI problems. Now it could go the other way around in the sense that I, I think building a complex quantum computer with say hundreds of thousands of good qubits, that itself is a control problem that we can't really fathom right now. Maybe we need some type of um, AI approach just building that thing or understanding how to use it, uh, how to optimize, uh, Jay mentioned the circuits, how to compress the circuits so that you can squeeze more information in a given amount of time, for instance. Um, so maybe it goes the other way around, but I should stop talking because I'm <laughs> probably the lowest uh, uh, lowest on the stack here in terms of expertise in AI. No, that's, that's great, thank you, thanks a lot. Ashok Raman is asking, how does a semiconductor guy get into the hardware side of quantum computing and someone else is asking, where can I read more material about this field? 
So anybody can answer this. Oh, maybe I could say something quickly, Please. which is if, if you are a semiconductor person, you're already in that field of quantum information. You just don't know it because you already have 90%, maybe more of the knowledge you need to do this. Uh, all you need to do is take your semiconductor background and shrink it to individual particles, individual atoms or electrons, something that you and many of us have been trying to do in classical electronics forever, never actually really got there in a practical way. But ironically, now one can do with, with semiconductors for quantum information. So I would say it's, it's a relatively modest step to make from where you are. And you know, others should chime in here, but I, Marina can probably address this uh, better than me. But I think a really simple way is to start engaging with the literature, right? And I think you'll be surprised, honestly, how quickly you'll come up to speed. Yeah, I, I really like your uh, analogy, David, uh, about yeah the students or, or professionals already being trained for the field. So whether you're on the theory side, for example, in, in our field, uh, DFT calculations and, and many different types of simulations are, are really needed. On the experimental side, if you have experience with nanofabrication, uh, with device design, that is also very useful on so many fronts. So uh, you can probably just repurpose your skill set for, for this field. Yeah, yeah maybe I can, I can generalize sorry, that question. Oh, please. Yeah, so I mean, I think you could generalize it just if you're working at the, at, you know, at the forefront of basically most, most science and, you know, technological areas, um, you are probably going to have an interface with QUIST because QUIST is like, if you think of a surface to volume ratio, right, where the volume of technology that we have versus the boundary of, you know, where we are, it's, it's all surface basically. So the, we really want, you know, there's a lot of um, room for connection. And I, and I agree with David that it's, sometimes it's hard to know where to look, but they're actually, you know, use Google, right? Just Google like semiconductor quantum device and you'll see all the papers coming out and you'll see that actually there's a lot of stuff when you start looking into the figures and the supplementary, you'll say like, oh, I know how to do this. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Jay, did you wanna say something also? I mean, like, did somebody wanna say something? Uh, I, yeah, I, I, I always joke around that in semiconductors, you, you're you fighting making the quantum noise uh, smaller and now you're trying to make the quantum noise bigger. So a lot of the skills and things that, you used to, that you've done in learning that technology, of how to actually suppress the effects of quantum noise. Now you're trying to make them bigger and lots of things go across. We have a lot of success transitioning people um, from that background into, into quantum and it actually leads to a lot of innovation. So I agree with what David and Maria said and, and um, I would just start looking at material and, and reading a bit about it and you'll see the similarities. Thank you, Jay. And you know, regarding uh, you know, where can I read about this? You know, like if you're not, uh, if you want to read about it in Scientific American and other you know places where it's written in a way that is understandable, that would be good. Otherwise, I mean, of course, there are journals, but I think that you can maybe start out if you're new in this area. I love this book by Terry Rudolph, which is called Q is for Quantum. It's a very you know easy to read book. But if you want some high level book, then Nielsen and Chong's book is like the classic textbook in this area. So that, that's another one that you can actually take a look at. This is one of the questions that somebody had posed. All right, so I think that we are coming to the end of this panel and I want to ask everybody to spend you know, one minute or less telling us all about an exciting and wild prediction that they want to make based upon their gut feeling about what we would be able to accomplish in this area of quantum information science and technology within the next 10 years. So within this decade. All right, why don't we go first with, let's say, uh, David. Really? Okay, um, sure. Well, of course, there, there are lots of funny sayings about predictions, but the one thing is, again, you can almost be sure you're going to be wrong. Uh, but I would say, you know, Jay has alluded to some, but I think, you know, to me, I, I think what's likely to happen in the next 10 years uh, in terms of exciting developments will be things we're not discussing today. And I really believe that. And, you know, one example that might come to mind is imagine that with quantum sensors, something we haven't discussed very much here, right? We've talked a lot about computing and a little about communication. 
But imagine with quantum sensors, which are rapidly being developed, and Marina knows a lot about this, uh, you could take MRI and move it to the level of a single molecule, magnetic resonance imaging. Imagine the impact that would have in the world in pharmaceutical design, right? Personalized medicine. Um, you know, it would revolutionize areas of bioengineering and biochemistry. And if that happens with quantum information technologies, it will be extraordinary. And to Jeremy's point, that would change the way people think about hype and computing. And the amount of data that would produce would need quantum machines. So, you know, I, I do believe, I agree with Jay that in the next decade we'll have meaningful quantum machines, practical quantum machines that can really break uh, the point of we are, where we are today with supercomputers. But to me, I, I actually very much believe that might pale in comparison to what we're not pondering right now. Thank you, David. Chris, your prediction. Hmm. Yeah, um, I, I was I was glad that you said 10 years. I was afraid you were going to say like, you know, 12 months or two years. <laughs> um, you know, we, we are already seeing kind of inklings of, of something that is akin to quantum advantage or, you know, some in some academic sense, a very esoteric, non-tunable hardware that can that can do something that you can't do. You could also argue that the hydrogen atom can compute its own splitting of the ground state, you know, the hyperfine level of the ground state to, to 15 digits, we can't calculate it. But there's zero tunability there, zero. And so, you know, there, there's sort of a continuum. And I think the, the experiments in quantum supremacy and so forth are, they're moving the needle a little bit. There's a bit of tunability, but not so useful. So I think it will, there will be a continuum, but in 10 years, I think there will be a level of programmability in these devices that they will not just hit a single esoteric problem, but it will be, perhaps esoteric, but a whole class of problems that that might, uh, I, I'm, like, I agree with David, I don't know where that's gonna be, but it's probably gonna be some type of an optimization. Everything's an optimization, a absolutely everything is, I suppose. So that's not saying too much, but it will be something that will be worthwhile for the economy. People will pay for it. And that's really important because that will feed everything. And I'm not just talking about companies, it will feed universities. H having an economic uh, power behind these machines. I think in 10 years, I think it's a, Safe bet that something will score there, but I'll 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 uh, I'll put I'll, I'll uh, vote with David that I probably none of us probably know what that is. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Marina, your prediction. So, yeah, I'm I'm join this. So we can just throw ideas and then see in ten years if any of that comes uh, becomes true. But um, I'm really excited about the quantum internet and not just for all the exciting applications that we care about, you know, as researchers like cryptography and distributed quantum sensing and distributed quantum computing, but more of a social impact. So once we can actually carry the quantum information in long distance, how the society will react and what will say quantum hackers a future come up with? Will there be some exciting quantum games or some exciting quantum perks? So that's something that I'm looking forward to seeing as we're growing this beyond just our labs. Thank you, Marina. Jay, what, what about you? What's your prediction? Well, I, I, I already gave one, but I, I I'll say what I, today we see about a billion circuits running on our system. So in 10 years, I hope to see trillions of circuits run. And I, I hope that 90% of the people that are using them don't really understand the finer details of the circuit, but they know how to put them together in, in, in more abstract, higher level ways that we don't even know how to describe at the moment. And if we can do that, then I think we, we, they'll be using quantum for things that they, we can't even predict today. And if that comes out, I think then we can say uh, quantum has been successful. Thank you so much, Jay. What about you, Jeremy? Your prediction? I was, I was hoping to run out the clock here, but um, so I guess what I would really like to see is um, a single qubit that is undergoes continuous quantum error correction behind a glass case that says "Do not disturb uh, indefinite," like the first qubit that is like in the zero plus one state. That would be, uh, I think, that would be a really great milestone. Thank you so much. You know, thanks to all of you for those exciting predictions. The second quantum revolution has really started a new era, just like the space program. And I know there'll be a lot of exciting spin-offs also. 
and I'm looking forward to seeing which of your predictions are correct in the coming decade. And I'm extremely sorry about not being able to take a lot of questions that you know came through the chat uh, here. I mean, I guess we need an entire day to discuss this topic so that hour was not enough. But thanks so much for those questions. And you know, maybe you can send individual emails and we can try to answer them. And I wanna thank all of the panelists for the wonderful discussion. And I also want to thank all of you out there for watching. And I hope that the discussions were helpful for you. And some of you are already thinking about launching your own career in this exciting area of quantum information science and technology that is growing at an exponential rate. And I would like to close the session by giving a shout out to all of the IITs. IIT ka tempo, high hair. And uh, of course, you know, like our tempo will always be high. And I will be remiss if I actually did not actually talk about my own IIT, IIT Kharagpur. So let me give a shout out to my own alma mater, KGP ka tempo high hair. Let's keep working hard and keep working smart to make this world a better place for everyone. And let's live up to what Gandhiji said. You know, he inspired us to actually be the change we want to see in the world. And finally, I would like to thank Ron Gupta for inviting me to organize this session. And so thank you again to all the panelists and to all of you out there watching. Stay healthy, everybody. Goodbye.